as we begin this uh, studio study through the book of Titus. I'm always interested by the idea of how we take the approach to a book like this. Do we give a lengthy introduction, which sometimes is very profitable, give you a better idea of the author, the recipients, the context, the date, the place it was written from, the place it was written to, all those kind of things. Or what I usually prefer to do is to address those as we get into the text itself. So let's do that together. The book of Titus, the Apostle Paul's letter to his younger associate Titus, chapter 1, verse 1, where we read this. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which is according to to godliness. Now, that's just the first verse, but stop. It gives us a lot to think about right there in this letter. First of all, it tells us the author of the letter. The first word of the book of Titus, the letter to Titus, is Paul. In the ancient world, the custom was to not give the name of the recipient in the letter first, as we might write today, dear John, dear Jane. In the ancient world, the practice was to give the author of the letter first, and that's exactly what Paul does. He's following the normal letter-writing practices of his day, and he says, Paul, and then he's introducing himself with some well-chosen titles. Look at the text right there. The two phrases he uses are, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Think about those two things. First of all, Paul lists himself first as a servant, a servant of God, Secondly, as an apostle of Jesus Christ, it it should be noted that he takes the more humble title first. Now, I'm not going to say that the title servant of God is entirely humble, because even though the idea of that ancient word is a bond slave, someone who chooses slavery willingly, someone who's a slave for life, it's a pretty strong word describing somebody's condition of slavery. That's true. Yet, there is a wonderful history in the Old Testament of the person who is considered the servant of God or the servant of Yahweh, most notably the Messiah itself. In some amazing passages, for example, in the book of Isaiah, the Messiah himself is presented as the ultimate servant of God. So it's a humble title with with a touch of great background behind it in the Hebrew scriptures. But there's no doubt about this, that if you were to compare the title servant of God and compare it next to the title Apostle of Jesus Christ, there's no doubt that Servant of God is a more humble title, and that's the title that Paul thinks of himself first as. You know, sometimes we can get exalted notions of what the apostolic is all about, and there's no doubt that there's a sense in which Paul understood that he, uh, under God's divine plan for that first century church, and the legacy of that continues to this day, Paul's apostolic authority in that time is what I mean. There's a sense in which uh, apostle is a a glorious title, but yet Paul very demonstrably says, first I'm a servant of God, then I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, notice the next phrase in there in verse 1. According to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth, which is according to godliness. It's fascinating because With the second half of verse 1, Paul introduces two significant themes that are going to be referred to several times in the letter following that he brings to Titus. Notice, first of all, he says that he is a servant and an apostle according to the faith of God's elect. That's a very interesting concept, or at least it's an interesting concept in my mind. You see, Paul understood that his position as a servant— And as an apostle, it really was um, in harmony with the faith of God's elect, with what was believed among the people of God, the, the body of faith, what we'd call the doctrine, what Christians in common believe together. There is this concept in the New Testament where we talk about faith, and of course, faith is a very important part of the Christian life. Remember what it says in Hebrews, that without faith it is impossible to please God. So there's that concept definitely of faith repeated many times, but don't forget likewise that there is the concept of the faith. For example, in the book of Jude, he talks about the faith once for all delivered to the saints. 
and when the term is used in that sense, it's used in the sense of this um, collection of Christian truth, which maybe in the early church in some way, not in a complete way, but in some way was collected in the Apostles' Creed. Uh, in other times was collected just sort of in an understanding of the essentials of the gospel. But what we're talking about when we talk about the faith is we're talking about that which Christians believed in common. And there's going to be a, a close look here in the book of Titus about the importance of truth. We as Christians, when we gather together, we're not just a social club. We're not just a collection of people who have a good cause together, e even though there's a place for that in the world. No, we are a people who believe things in common. There is a common belief, a common body of doctrine. And it's true, there are some ideas, uh, there's some concepts in that body of doctrine that are sort of out on the edges and Christians may disagree with. But listen, Christians believe together in the, the divinity of Jesus Christ, that, that Jesus is the Messiah, in fact, that he is the Christ, the centrality of what he did for us on the cross. We believe that he rose from the dead and that this is a non-negotiable. We believe that he established a church, a body to follow after him. We believe that he's coming again. We believe that he sent the Holy Spirit. I mean, th there are certain things that we as Christians, we believe in common. Crossing denominational lines. You, you go outside these basic things and you, you either are or are in danger of forfeiting your place among the body of Christians because you are denying the faith of God's elect. So that's the first thing it deals with in verse 1. Paul introduces himself and he says that he's a servant and apostle according to the faith of God's elect. But now notice the second part of verse 1. And the acknowledgement of the truth, which is according to godliness. Now notice what he's saying there. He, he's coming back to the idea of truth, but he's telling us that this truth that all Christians should acknowledge is according to godliness. It should have an effect on how we live. Now, this is going to be an important part that we touch on later on in the book of Titus, that God's grace, God's truth, what God does for us, it affects our life towards godliness, that what we believe isn't only ideas in our head, but what we believe affects the way that we live. So again, it's, it's a thrilling beginning here. Uh, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledgement of truth, of the truth, which is according to godliness. Now verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Did you get that point? The connecting idea here is that God has given this faith, this truth, which is according to godliness. He's given this truth revealed by the gospel, revealed in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Why? In the hope of eternal life. Now listen, sometimes I think that we as Christians, we bounce between two extremes. The one extreme is maybe thinking about heaven too much. I suppose it's theoretically possible for a person to be so heavenly minded that they're of no earthly good. But I tend to find that the people who are most properly heavenly minded are of the most eternal good. But, but let's just say it's at least possible for a person to become too focused on heaven. That's one thing. I think the far more common error for us in the Christian life is that we're not focused on heaven enough. We don't think enough about the greatness, the glory, about what God has promised for us and will do for us with eternal life. And to remember this, that eternal life does not begin when we die. Eternal life is given to us as a gift of God in Jesus Christ right here, right now. This is the great promise of God to us. So we have this body of truth, this truth that impacts us for godliness. It's given to us in hope of eternal life, which God, look at that in verse 2, who cannot lie promised before time began. I see in that phrase, too, really exciting ideas. The first one, uh, I'll deal with the second one uh, first, is the idea that God has made this promise before time began. Now, I want you to think about that. What that reflects on is that God has an eternal plan of the ages that he set in motion from eternity past and that he's working out 
and has promised to absolutely complete in eternity future. Brother, sister, I'm telling you, God is not making this up as he goes along. He has a plan. He has a purpose. And that plan was initiated. I love that phrase that Paul uses. Look at that. Before time began. I don't even know how to take that in. Apparently, there was a time in God's universe. There was a time in God's creation before time even began. And that's a thrilling idea, isn't it? That, that again, there's a time before time was. And I'm going to speculate this, that there will be a time when time has ended. But, but before time began, God set in motion a wonderful plan of the ages. And the truth that he has revealed to us in Jesus Christ, the truth of the gospel, the truth that we collectively believe as the people of God, this truth was um, launched, was understood, was prepared for, was, was, was brought forth before time began. That's when God made that promise, I should say. Now, verse 2 tells us something else. It says, and this is the portion before the promise, before time began. It says, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie. I don't know about you, but that thrills me. Doesn't it thrill you? The simple idea that God cannot lie. You know, there are some things that God can't do. Have you ever thought about that? Uh, every once in a while, people will think that they've posed a very clever theological question. They'll go something like this. They'll say, can God make a rock so big that he can't lift it? And sometimes they'll sort of fold their arms and act very smug. I've asked an impossible question. Well, listen, logically, it's a nonsensical question. It's a, it's a question that just loops back on itself. It doesn't make any sense. So a nonsensical question doesn't make sense just because you put God in the question. It, it's a question that should just be disregarded. But I'll tell you this, there are some things for which it is impossible for God to do. And what do I mean by that? Brothers and sisters, it is impossible for God to lie. When God makes his promises in the word, they are always true. He can never lie. It is impossible for God to lie. I think that's a thrilling thought, don't you? Now, it is possible for us to misunderstand or to misapply God's promises. It's possible for us to take a promise that's in this book, in the Bible, that God made to somebody else and for us to apply it to ourselves. And then maybe if that promise is fulfilled, we think that God let us down. I'm here to tell you, God didn't let you down. You took a true promise of God and misapplied it to yourself. There's also sometimes where we think that the timing of God's promises, that we should be able to sort of dictate to him the timing of those promises. So we understand not every promise in the Bible is directed to us. We also understand that God has a wisdom in his timing that goes beyond our wisdom. But the simple truth is this. When God makes a promise, it is impossible for him to lie. We can take a renewed confidence in the promises of God. Now, Going on to verse 3, and I, I want to go back, if you don't mind, to the beginning of verse 1 and get a running start to verse 3 because I just love the flow. You know, we're looking at this in some depth, and one of the problems when you look at a piece of Scripture in some depth is you lose a sense of the flow. I want to try to remedy that by, from time to time, going back to the beginning and working our way again. Are you ready for this? So now, starting Titus chapter 1, verse 1, and now we're going to read all the way through the end of verse 3. Here we go. Paul, a servant of God, and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth, which is according to godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, now verse 3, but has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God, our Savior. Again, I know I'm saying this about every verse, but it's true about every verse. I love this phrasing. Look at verse 3. But has in due time manifested his word through preaching. All right. Think about this piece by piece. The first thing, has in due time manifested. This is a remarkable message that God knew exactly what he was doing in the timing of when he sent his son, Jesus Christ. Now, 
Uh, this is something that in some ways is a little bit counterintuitive. What do I mean by that? Well, it's counterintuitive because I can think, wouldn't it, it have been better for humanity? Wouldn't it have been better for the human race if God sent Jesus of Nazareth 2,000 years before he actually sent him, uh, closer to the time of Abraham than the time of Jesus, you know, the first century? Wouldn't it have been better for the human? Wouldn't more of humanity lived under the great work and the teaching and the revelation of the Messiah? I can think like that, but I have to come back that no, God knew what he was doing in the timing of sending the Son. He was in due time manifest. It reminds me of another passage of scripture that says this that in the fullness of time, God brought forth the Messiah. And when we take a look, at the historical environment of the days in which Jesus came, we understand that this really was true. You know, in the first century Roman world, there was a common language like there had never been before. This common language was a common Greek, Koine Greek, and it was the language of trade and business and literature. Like never before in the world, there was a common language that united the world, and that could be a vehicle for the message of the Messiah. There were virtually no frontiers because of the vast nature of the Roman Empire. In those days, in the first century, like never before in the history of the world, travel was comparatively easy. Now, it was slow. You can't really compare it to travel in our day, but it was relatively safe because of the security of the Roman Empire and because of the excellent system of Roman roads that were built all over the Roman Empire. The world was largely at peace under what was known as the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome. Now, it was an opposed peace. It was something of an oppressive peace, but travel, the spread of ideas, the missionary concern, this was, in some sense, the earliest point in human history when the gospel could be given wide effect over the entire world. And so we could say that God knew in due time he manifested his world. I'll give you one other thing. According to historians, and I'm going to quote a guy named William Barclay on this point. William Barclay says that the world was uniquely conscious of its need for a Messiah when Jesus came. Quoting William Barclay, there was never a time when the hearts of men were more open to receive the message of salvation which Christian missionaries brought, end quote. Again, this idea from William Barclay, that God had even prepared the hearts and minds of men and women all across the Roman Empire, all across what was thought to be then the civilized world, to receive the message, it shows that in due time, God manifested his word through preaching. Now, I want you to think about that phrase, too. Manifested his word through preaching. Do, do you know what the word manifested means? Manifested means to make visible, to, to make apparent. For example, out of the span of this camera, I, I have a coffee cup here. Uh, it's invisible to you, the viewer. It, it's not invisible to me. I can see it. But to you, the viewer, this coffee cup is invisible. Now, I'm going to manifest this coffee cup. I'm going to pick it up and bring it in the camera, and you can see my enduring word, coffee cup. The, now it's manifest. Uh, now it's not. D do you see the difference? Manifest, not manifest. Now, how do words, how does the word of God, the message of God, become manifest? Notice he says here in verse 3, has in due time manifested his word through preaching. Now, I know that there is a sense in which God's word is made manifest, visible, through the lives of his people. We live out the truth of the gospel. We live out the results of the gospel. But I want you to understand, there's an even more fundamental way that God makes his truth manifest, and it's through preaching. God intends that his word be preached, that the message of rescue in Jesus Christ be proclaimed, and that's how the word is manifest. That's how it becomes visible and known to the world, through preaching. There is such a high place for the proclamation of the gospel. And let me tell you something about that preaching. That preaching doesn't have to happen behind a pulpit. 
It doesn't have to happen on, you know, in front of a camera. That preaching can happen in the most wonderful, informal, one-to-one ways as God's people just uh, proclaim the word at a coffee house over a cup of good coffee, um, at uh, a park, uh, together on a job site, at a school cafeteria. Some of the best preaching that happens in the Christian world doesn't happen behind a pulpit or in front of a camera. It happens one-on-one. But when you faithfully present the beautiful message of what God has done in the person and work of Jesus Christ, especially what he's done at the cross, to bear the sin and the guilt and the shame of humanity, and to triumph over it, evidenced by the resurrection. When you present that message, you are making manifest the word of God. I love that. But has in due time manifested his word. I'm reading again from verse 3 here of Titus chapter 1. But as in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Paul believed that this work of preaching, this work of making manifest God's word through preaching, that was committed to him. In other words, given to him as a stewardship, as a trust. Uh, It wasn't just for him to play around with whatever. Paul felt like he was a constrained man, a bound man. He couldn't do just whatever he pleased with the word of God. He had to do what was right and good with the word of God. It was committed to him. And again, by the command of God, our Savior. This wasn't an option. In another place, Paul says, and he's speaking of himself, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. He would have been disobedient to the command of God if he did not fulfill that calling, that purpose that God had upon his life. And I guess you could say in some sense, it's true of all of us. Not that we have the same calling, the same command that the Apostle Paul had, but we do have whatever command, whatever purpose God has placed upon our life, and we need to fulfill that as if it is a command. All right, I'm sort of getting lost in the individual aspects of these great verses, but let me start again from the top. Now read all the way through verse 4, where we read this. Okay, beginning at verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth, which is according to godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, but has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me, according to the commandment of God our Savior, to Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. You know, it's always a bit of a challenge for someone like me who loves to teach the Bible. How much do I drill down on every detail? You know, in this first session through the book of Titus, we're only going to cover five verses. Uh, we're coming to the close here because we, we've, we've made our way to verse 4. I'm going to talk about verse 4, then we're going to talk about verse 5. But what I'm saying is we're easily more than halfway done in this particular study. And um, I enjoy talking about the wonderful exactness and deep meaning of every phrase, of every verse. But I don't want us to miss the big picture. What's the big picture? This was a letter written from Paul to a man named Titus. What do we know about Titus? Well, it's kind of fascinating. We don't know a lot about Titus other than what we have in the book of Titus and what we have in 2 Corinthians. Isn't that kind of interesting? Let me kind of blow your mind with this that you may not have considered. Titus is not mentioned to us in the book of Acts at all. He's not mentioned at all. Now, we we have reason to believe that he had common ministry with the Apostle Paul during the period described in the book of Acts. And we have reason to believe that the book of Titus, and I'm going to get into this when we talk about verse 5, that the letter to Titus deals with things that happened after the book of Acts, after Paul was released from the Roman custody or imprisonment that's described at the end of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 28. But Titus is not mentioned by name. Now, there's a couple things. We're going to talk about Titus. We're going to talk about the mentions that are made of him throughout this book and in 2 Corinthians. But I want you to consider this. Doesn't it kind of blow your mind to consider that? 
there were many wonderful associates for the Apostle Paul that are not mentioned for us by name in the book of Acts. The, the book of Acts does not tell us the whole story. It is in itself an incomplete story. It doesn't tell us everything about what God was doing in the days of the early church. Oh, it tells us wonderful things. It tells us important things, but it does not tell us everything. It doesn't tell us anything about Titus. Now, where do we learn about Titus? Well, first of all, here, Titus chapter 1, verse 4, we learn that Titus was a true son in our common faith. Back to the idea of the common faith, we talked about that in verses 1 uh, and 2 makes a reference to it. So we do have this idea of a common faith, this common body of belief, of truth that Christians believe together. And Titus was a true son in that common faith. Listen, let me tell you something. If the Apostle Paul ever called me a true son in our common faith, you'd never get me to shut up about it. I'd wear a t-shirt with that on it all the time. True son in our common faith. I mean, this is high praise from the Apostle Paul. Now, that's not all that's said about Titus. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13 says that Titus was a genuine brother to the Apostle Paul. Again, high words of praise. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 23 says that Titus was a partner and a fellow worker with Paul. Again, wonderful titles. I, I would love it for someone uh, that God used as mightily as the Apostle Paul to say of me, or you would love it to have said of you, that that person was a partner and a fellow worker. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18, says that Titus walked in the same spirit as Paul. And that same verse, again, 2 Corinthians 12, 18, tells us that Titus walked in the same steps as Paul, the same manner of life. Therefore, Titus chapter 2, verse 7 tells us that Titus could be a pattern to other believers uh, because he was so faithful in his Christian life. This man, Titus, even though we don't know anything about him from the book of Acts, he seems to be a remarkable man. And when we consider the work that is entrusted to him, we're going to get into that in verse 5 in just a moment, he seems to be a guy that Paul could trust to do great things. Let me read to you a quote from Charles Spurgeon regarding Titus. He says this, quote, He, and he's talking about Titus here, He seems to have been a man of great common sense, so that when Paul had anything difficult to be done, he sent Titus. When the collection was to be made at Corinth on behalf of the poor saints at Jerusalem, Paul sent Titus to stir up the members and with him, another brother, to take charge of the contributions. So it almost seems like Titus was something of a troubleshooter for the Apostle Paul. When there was a difficult job to do or a job that required some delicacy, some diplomacy, send Titus to do it. Why? Well, verse 4 says, because he was a true son in our common faith. I love that. It's not only the common faith of Paul, but of all the people of God. That there is a body of truth, of doctrine, if you want to use that word, that belongs to us collectively together as Christians. And then he gives this familiar greeting to Titus. Did you notice that in verse 4? Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. Just to touch on this, because again, I could talk about this a long time. Notice, back in verse 3, he talks about the commandment of God, our Savior. Now, at the end of verse 4, he talks about the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. The fact that Paul applies to Jesus, right there in the first four verses, the title Lord and Savior, and that he attributes those titles also to God in heaven, shows Paul understood that Jesus Christ is God. Now, that's a radical message that we as Christians have. And it's not the last time in the book of Titus that we're going to come up against this idea that Paul understood that Jesus Christ, that Jesus of Nazareth, a man with flesh and blood, just like you and I have, a man who spoke words that could be heard audibly, a man that had hair on his head, uh, a, a, a man who slept at night and ate food like anybody else. Jesus Christ, this person who was a true man, Jesus of Nazareth was nevertheless God. God made man. 
uh, when God added humanity to his deity and came to this earth. It's a remarkable statement. And again, the idea is there because he speaks of the commandment of God, our Savior, in verse 3, and now he speaks about the Lord, which is a heavy title, Jesus Christ, our Savior, there in verse 4. But I don't want you to miss what the introduction was in verse 4. Notice that phrase, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father. Paul understands that that grace, mercy, and peace isn't coming from himself. It's coming from God. He's just sort of a messenger of God's grace, mercy, and peace. Now, if you're familiar with the other writings of Paul, because this isn't the only letter that Paul wrote. Paul wrote letters to other individuals, uh, two letters to Timothy, which we have in our New Testaments, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. Paul also wrote a letter to a man named Philemon. Um, So we have what we call the pastoral letters or epistles, Titus, that we're studying now, 1 and 2 Timothy and Philemon. But then Paul also wrote to individual churches, Corinthians, the church in Corinth, uh, the church in Rome, Romans, the church as of Galatia, because Galatia wasn't a city, it was a region, the church of Philippi, the church of Colossa, the church of Thessalonica. Okay, all all those things. We, we, We see those different places that he wrote to. Now, when Paul wrote letters to churches, he would commonly give the greeting. You can look it up for yourself in the first few verses of all those letters. Grace and peace. To the church at Rome, grace and peace. To the church at Corinth, grace and peace. But you know what's fascinating? He's using there a familiar concept from Greek or Roman culture, the idea of charis, grace, a grace greeting. And he's tying together there a concept from Jewish or Hebrew culture, the idea of shalom, peace. It's a greeting that people use today in Hebrew in Israel. Shalom, they'll say one to another. So he's giving a greeting, as it were, one from the Roman or Greek world and one from the Jewish Hebrew world grace and peace. But notice this, when he writes to Titus and when he writes to Timothy, you can look it up yourself. When he writes to Titus and Timothy, he says, grace, mercy, and peace. What does that prove? It proves this, that pastors need more mercy than anybody else. That's an important thought, isn't it? We as pastors, we need the mercy of God, and we need it maybe in a greater measure than anybody else. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. Now we come to verse 5. Now, in verse 5, and this is the last verse we're going to consider in this first session of teaching uh, in Titus, we finally get to the reason for the letter. Have you noticed I kind of haven't ignored that whole thing? Why? We, We understood who wrote the letter, Paul, something about him. We understand who received the letter, Titus. Why did Paul write this letter to Titus? Look here at verse 5. For this reason, I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. Okay, did you get that? There was a reason Paul did something. What did he do? He said, for this reason, I left you in Crete. Now, let's understand what we're talking. We're talking about the island of Crete which is an island in the Mediterranean. You know, the Mediterranean has a few significant islands. Cyprus is one island. Crete is another island. A smaller island is Malta, um, off the coast of Italy, Sicily. is Okay, we could go on and on, talk about some notable islands in the Mediterranean. There's not many of them, but there are a few. Crete is an island in the Mediterranean. And it says there that Paul left Titus in Crete. Okay, what does that mean? It means that they were together there. Paul couldn't have left Titus in Crete unless they were there together to begin with. Paul left Titus in Crete to do this job. To do what job? Well, to set in order the things that are lacking, he says there, uh, and to appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. I want you to understand this that uh, Paul and Titus, and probably others as well, apparently after Paul's release from Roman custody at the end of Acts chapter 28, this remarkable missionary of the early church went out and did a variety of things, 
Uh, I'm sure he visited some of the other churches that he had planted. There seems to be some evidence that he went to Spain. But one thing that he seems to have done was to go to the island of Crete and do something of an evangelistic ministry or message or campaign through the island. And through the many different cities of Crete, Christian congregations were established. And now these Christian congregations needed godly leadership. Paul left Titus behind to complete that job. Here's the job that you need to do, Titus. You need to um, finish that work, or at least further the work. Maybe the work would never be finished in a proper sense. You need to further that work of getting these Christian congregations rooted and established, and you're going to do it by appointing godly leaders for those many different congregations in the many different cities on the island of Crete. So that's what he did. Paul and Titus apparently had this evangelistic ministry there on the island of Crete. He leaves them behind, and this is what he's supposed to do. Again, look at verse 5, that you should set in order the things that are lacking. That's a very interesting phrase. There were things that were lacking. Now, according to Warren Wearsby, that is a medical phrase that refers to setting a crooked limb, like if an arm is broken and kind of crooked, Setting it in the right place is setting it in order. There were things lacking, and Titus, through his godly leadership and through the appointment of other godly leaders, was to work to set those things in lack. God wants things in proper order in his church. Now, it is possible for church life to become too orderly, if you know what I mean, too rigid too hierarchical, you know, where there's too much of a, you know, top-down structure, so to speak, too much of an order of authority. But these things are exaggerations or distortions of a fundamentally true principle that God has for his church. And here's the fundamentally true principle. God wants his churches to be places of order, uh, places of structure, places of an order of authority. Now, again, I'm the first one to say, can those things be exaggerated and distorted? Is it possible for authority to become too rigid and abusive within a church? Yes, it is possible. Matter of fact, I think this is one of Satan's chief strategies against God's proper authority in the home, in the community, uh, at the workplace, in the church. The abuse of authority discredits the idea of authority. And that's why Satan has such a vested interest in promoting the abuse of authority. But just because authority can be abused doesn't mean that God doesn't have an order of authority. He wanted Titus to go in there and set in. If you're the one who goes and sets things in order, you have some legitimate authority from God to do so. And if you're going to be appointing elders, you have some legitimate authority by God to appoint those elders. And those elders will have some position of authority in the church that they do. Again, it, can, can that hierarchy and can that authority be exaggerated beyond godly intent? Absolutely it can. Can that authority be abused? Yes, it can. But it doesn't mean that God has in mind in his church what is sometimes turned to be an entirely flat structure organization where there is no order of authority where everything is on a completely level plane. Now, it is true that God wants in his body everyone to enjoy mutual respect, mutual edification, mutual promotion of the common good. But that doesn't take away from this idea that God has an order of authority. So, brothers and sisters, uh, we need to recognize that God has this order, and God sent Titus commissioned him to remain there uh, to do this job. And might I say, I think this was going to be a difficult job. After the successful evangelistic campaign on the island of Crete, there were a lot of young Christians and churches to take care of. Paul commissioned Titus to stay there to build stable churches with mature, qualified pastors for the people. But that was especially necessary in Crete because... In the ancient world, they had a reputation for being a wild bunch. Now, I'm not speaking about modern-day people on the island of Crete. I don't have any idea what the character, what the disposition 
of the people on the island of Crete are today. But in the ancient world, I can tell you, they were known for being liars. They were known for being lazy. They were known for just being an uncooperative group of people. And Titus had a difficult job to do to find and train capable leaders to lead that now saved but formerly wild bunch of people on the island of Crete. I'm kind of captivated by that idea that this was a difficult job. So Paul said, I got to send Titus. You know, when a job is hard, there's basically two kinds of people. With the first kind of person, you say, that job is hard. Don't send them. But the other kind of person is, that job is hard. You got to send that person. Listen, each and every one of us should endeavor to be Christians of such strength, of such character, so in fulfillment of the calling that God has given us, that we're of that second type. That when there's a difficult job to do, and if it fits within our calling, I'm I'm not suggesting that we should act outside of the calling that God has given to us, but when there's a difficult job to do that falls within our calling, well, you got to send that person to do it because they're the kind of person who can see the job done. That's the kind of idea that Paul had when he left Titus there. Uh, Another thing to consider is that the phrasing, and again, I'm getting this from some commentators on the passage, the phrasing of the term, I left you in Crete, it uses the same wording as Paul used in 2 Timothy chapter 4 when he left behind a cloak that is a coat and an associate left behind temporarily. In other words, the idea is, This was a temporary assignment for Titus. It it might be a long assignment. It might take him some period of time to do this work, but it wasn't a forever assignment. It was something of a temporary assignment for Titus to do. And what was he supposed to do? Look at it there in verse 5. Set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. The answer for... uh, maturity, stability, moving forward with the work of the gospel on the island of Crete was not less leadership, was not an abdication of leadership. It wasn't, well, let's just have a flat down organization and who cares about leadership? No, the answer to it was godly leadership and more godly leaders. Again, we're going to talk about this a lot in our next session because in the next session, Paul is going to begin to describe the character of leaders that Titus should look for and promote. And so we understand that it's so important for leaders in God's family to have this kind of character. But do we understand? The answer was not in less leadership, but in better leadership. And if I could even say more leadership, because there were churches, as it says there in verse 5, in every city. There were many churches on the island of Crete that needed this leadership And that was Titus's job, to go there and to build these leaders and to do it. So really, that kind of brings us to an end of what we're seeing here in these first five verses. We begin just with Paul introducing himself, referring to this common body of truth that Christians collectively believe. Uh, He talks about the commitment that God made to him to do this, to Titus and the special job that Titus had to do. Uh, Let let me kind of end with this simple idea, is that, God gave, through the Apostle Paul, a job, a work for Titus to do. And Titus needed some help in doing that work. In other words, you could say that Paul was delegating a work to Titus, and this letter is all about teaching and training Titus to do that job better. Well, listen, what has God called you to do? Now, maybe God has called you to have some kind of ministry Uh, either to his people or a needy world. Maybe your ministry is in the, among the children in a Sunday school. Maybe it's among youth, uh, student ministry. Uh, Maybe it's very practical. Maybe, maybe you're one of those blessed guys who serves in the parking lot of a church and makes sure that people have a safe place to park. Uh, Maybe you're one of those blessed people who help pick up chairs. Maybe you're one of those people who help with a uh, homeless ministry or a rescue mission within your community. Maybe you just go out and find a way to share the love of Jesus wherever you're at. Here's what I'm just saying is you might need more training, more equipping for that. Titus was a pretty good guy. 
And this letter was written to give him more training and equipping. Isn't it possible that you've come upon this teaching here through the first five verses of the book of Titus, and we'll continue on after this. Isn't it possible that you've come upon this teaching because God wants to better equip you for the work that he's called you to do in the world? I don't think it means that you're going to move to the island of Crete and start appointing elders in the churches of every city, but it does mean that God has a race for you to run. God has a calling for you to fulfill. God has some kind of way for you to advance his kingdom. Maybe it's for you to to just work hard and honestly and with integrity in the job that he's given you to do and to shine your light there. Maybe it has something to do with the children that you're raising right now or the community that you're in. Maybe it has to do with what we think about more formally. I don't know. That's between you and God, but I'm here to tell you that we're going to learn some things together in this study through this letter to Titus that will better equip you to fulfill the calling and the purpose that God has for you in his kingdom. And I got to say, I'm pretty excited about that. 